Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1995 erotic vampire movie, Embrace of the Vampire. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on a film that probably was shown late at night on Cinemax back in the day, I want to give a special shout out to Brock for requesting this review. And if there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, Feel free to donate to my PayPal. The link will be in the video description down below, and I'll try to get to it as soon as I possibly can. Now, Embrace of the Vampire is a really cheap, low-budget knockoff of uh, popular vampire movies around the time, like Embra like uh, Interview with a Vampire. I almost said Embrace of the Vampire again. Yeah, Interview with a Vampire or Bram Stoker's Dracula. In fact, the director of this film, uh, Anne uh, Gorsod, she actually was one of the editors of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And I think that's probably why she got the job to direct this, to be honest, because of the fact that she edited Bram Stoker's Dracula. Which, you know, sometimes editors can turn into really good directors uh, or, or cinematographers can turn into good directors. But that isn't really a common thing. I think most of the time it's more of like a DP that becomes a good director, like Jan de Bont or something. Not necessarily an editor. Like there are cases of that happening, but a lot of the time the transition from editor to director is not nearly as smooth. And Anne Gorsod's direction is just limp. It's limp and anemic. It doesn't really have a... a a good amount of virility to it or verve or energy it's very flat it's very uninspired uh it's very stock standard and stiff uh you can definitely tell that she doesn't have a ton of experience directing films i think prior to this she directed like an episode of the red shoe diaries um and this honestly looks about on par with the average uh, direction in an episode of that show which in itself was just an excuse for nudity. Really, it was just softcore porn, the uh, TV series. And Embrace of the Vampire is, is, is the same exact sort of thing. I guess when it comes to shooting the nudity scenes, they're sufficiently uh, sexy, I guess. But anything else is really unimpressive. I understand she had a very low budget to work with. I think it was like $500,000. But genuinely talented filmmakers find a way to still showcase their style and showcase their skill. Whether or not the budget is significantly high uh, or not. And I know she went on to direct some other stuff after this. Like uh, Nine and a Half Weeks 2 and Poison Ivy 2. But I highly doubt that she improved that much as a director after this movie. Just seemed like a very limited filmmaker in terms of her scope, her cinematic eye, uh, and also in terms of working with her cast. Like, definitely not getting the best performances out of her cast in, in this movie. I mean, in particular, Martin Kemp as the vampire. He's supposed to be sophisticated or suave or sexy or intimidating or or kind of scary. And he's in none of those things. In fact, there are a lot of times where it seems like he's just kind of sleepwalking through his dialogue and is just drugged up and doesn't really give 100%. When it comes to his line delivery. And I, I I think in some ways. It's kind of the limitations of Martin Kemp as an actor. But in other ways. It's the director not really. Knowing. How to, to get the best out of him. Same thing happens. With Alyssa Milano. And Harrison Pruitt. And, and pretty much everyone else in the cast. Now. Even when it comes to scenes. That are supposed to be scary or suspenseful the direction falls flat uh, none of the sequences because of the way they're framed the way that they're shot really have any 
a uh, sense of adrenaline or uh, blood pumping through their veins. It's just it's just a very lifeless looking movie. Like it's not even a nice looking film when it comes to this to the the setting in terms of getting the most out of the locations or or any of the 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 sets. The the direction is completely uninspired and uninpressive, but the script is arguably worse. Like the script sucks. No pun intended. I mean Hallie Eaton, Nicole Coady, and Rick Bitzelberger, all three of them could not combine their heads together to write a competent script, which is honestly pretty shocking, where you have three writers, and they put their heads together, and and it, they can't even write an average screenplay, because with this particular film, there is let's just say maybe 10 to 12 minutes of an actual plot and story and everything else is just padding. It's padding to extend the running time. It's padding to provide uh, extra scenes of nudity and that's it. It doesn't help either that from the very opening sequence, you have this narration from the vampire, which by the way, you never get to know his name. He's just the vampire. And if we did get to know his name, I definitely don't don't remember it because it left that little of an impression on me. But yeah, so the vampire does this narration and he talks about his past and he says, back when I was a man, I was once in love. I'm like, when you back when you were once a man, so you're not a man anymore. So you're a vampire and you're also transgender. Like what what the hell is this line of dialogue? I understand what they're trying to go for, but it just sounds so clunky and off and laughable back when I was once a man. It's like, you, aren't you still a man? <laughs> you look like a man to me. Yeah, you're a vampire, but I didn't know when you became a vampire, you were no longer, uh, uh, you know, the same gender anymore. But, uh, yeah, he's <laughs> the guy says that back when he was a man, he was once in love, and you have this prologue that gives you a bit of backstory in the vampire and shows that he had a lover who died tragically, and at his lowest point, he was taken advantage of by these vampire women who wound up biting him and turned him into a vampire, and... Now it's decades later, and now he has to get another woman who is the direct reincarnation of the woman that he once loved to fall for him willingly and become a vampire and a bride of the undead. Otherwise, he will go into a permanent sleep. Uh, so he'll just go into a coma, I guess. I, what? I mean, I understand they set it up to create like a timeline and, and a time limit to, to increase the tension when it comes to the story, but it makes no sense. Like how many vampire movies have you seen that have like a, a, a time uh, crunch with the vampire where all the, well, you know, the vampire has to find this particular woman and has to get her to fall for him. Otherwise, he'll basically die. Not not because of sunlight, not because of a stake through the heart, not because of any of that, not because of like a vampire hunter trying to stalk him and kill him. No, he's got to get this girl to fall for him in three days. And if that doesn't work out, then he's fucked. You're like, what? So he's got he's to get her to willingly fuck him and be with him for centuries. Otherwise, he's screwed over in three days. Give me a break. Are you kidding me? This is this is ridiculous. And it doesn't stop there, there either. There's this like necklace that he gives her that's like an onk from like Egypt and it glows. And there's even like scenes where she, where uh 
Charlotte, uh, Alyssa Milano's character is like in a club full of people and she's wearing this onk and it's glowing and nobody's reacting to it. Like it, they just think it's like a part of uh, a regular uh, club attire, <laughs> glowing onks. So yeah. Yeah, there's barely anything with this plot. So the vampire guy, he finds out that Charlotte is the reincarnation of his his uh, lost lover from all those years ago. And so now he's got three days to get her to fall for him. And so he starts courting her. He starts showing up in her dreams. He starts uh, popping up and teleporting into her bedroom late at night and taking her top off, fondling her breasts, and being creepy, to be honest. And he just won't leave her alone. He starts driving a wedge between her and her boyfriend, Chris, and sends Jennifer Tilly, of all people, who plays this uh, character named uh, uh, Marika, to... Try to to try to get uh, Chris to cheat on um, Charlotte, and the vampires even putting all these images of uh, Chris cheating on her uh, in her brain. He's showing up when she is trying to pay attention to her studies at, at, in school and college and an art history class, and the vampire just just can't keep it in his pants so he just keeps showing up and teleporting and telling her to be with him and she's saying then she says no but he doesn't take no for an answer and just keeps being annoying like a lot of the time this vampire isn't sexy he's just annoying like the way he's written he just seems like a nuisance he doesn't seem like he it's a sexy thing that he keeps showing up and and uh um uh, courting charlotte it just seems like he's a, a, annoying like a gnat you want a swat or a mosquito a mosquito is more fitting because he, he you know he, he drinks blood and there's this other stuff where he'll kill some people that are connected with charlotte but in, in very boring ways like a neck snap here maybe a little bit of a neck bite but it might as well be a hickey because you don't see much of anything Kills this one girl who was acting like a bitch to Charlotte by bashing her head into a, into a door. And then this scene is supposed to be sexy, but I thought it was just silly. Where he bashes this girl's head into a door. The same door that Charlotte is hiding behind. And then the vampire just starts licking the blood off the door. And it's supposed to be hot and erotic, but I just thought it was laughable. He's just going, hum, ha, 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 that's some good door. Mm, that's some good wood right there. Like, like what? So, yeah, he's, he, he licks the door and eventually he breaks through and manipulates her enough to the point where she starts, you know, doing things differently she starts uh, getting involved in a short lesbian tryst with some photographer named Sarah, played by Charlotte Lewis. And then she goes to the club wearing the onk, wearing more suggestible. Uh, I don't know if suggestible is right, the, really the right word. But, you know, more, set, more revealing clothes. Because she was kind of, you know, she was wearing overalls over other outfits prior to this because she was still kind of in her shell trying to figure things out while she's going to college and it culminates exactly the way you think it is chris finds out where the vampire took her to he comes in gets involved between the two of them and it eventually causes charlotte to break out of the trance she was in the vampire runs out of time and he goes into a permanent sleep, uh, you know, and then that's it. That's that's embracing the vampire. There's never really a moment where Charlotte ever fully embraces the vampire in any capacity. So it's really not the same kind of thing as like Bram Stoker's Dracula with Mina 
and um yeah with mina and dracula like the whole stuff with uh, with dracula in that film it is really strong really effective when it comes to the 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 love that the two share with one another and that has a whole reincarnation aspect to it too uh the script the script here fails to even come remotely close to the same level of e efficiency and effectiveness as as that uh love story so like i said the vampire and him trying to get charlotte to fall for him just comes across as more irritating than anything else and the only thing that would really perk you up as a viewer is just the nudity just seeing Alyssa Milano's boobs and that's it because it's not not anything else as a horror film it's not scary in the slightest as a vampire movie you barely even see the vampire do a lot of vampire things except for maybe bite a few necks and that's it most of the time yeah he's got his sharp teeth and he's the Martin Kemp is talking through, uh, you know, uh, the the, the uh, fake teeth, so you know that he's he's a vampire in that regard. But it doesn't have a lot of the typical sort of vampire stuff, where you know he has vampire powers and vampire abilities, other than shooting lightning, shooting some force lightning. Other than that, there's really not a lot of the stuff, uh, other than him teleporting or using mind control. Um. Uh, apparently though this film did well on video which is a damn shame yeah according to the director she estimates that this film made at least 15 million dollars in home video like what 15 million this i i guess maybe 95 people were desperate enough to get to see some Alyssa Mil milano titties i guess i guess so 15 million I I, I kind of don't buy that, but who knows? Yeah, the script sucks. The acting sucks harder or just as hard. Uh, I, I would say probably the acting from the lead uh, guy as the vampire is, a, is, is what sucks the hardest. Like Martin Kemp was god awful in this. He, he gave Revenge of the Nerds energy. And every scene that he was in, I'm like, you might as well have just cast one of the cast members from that series of films. Uh, cast one of the Carradine brothers. Uh, it was just like, what, what, what even it is? This is just lame. It's not hot. The performance is really bad. It's really stilted. It almost sounds like English isn't even his first language, and we know that's not the case in Martin Kemp, but Martin Kemp is just not the right kind of guy to play this kind of role. It's just you just don't buy him as a sexy vampire or a badass. Like there's a whole scene where he's supposed to intimidate Chris in a bar, but he's got these like Lee press on sharp nails, and he's acting all tough with his leather jacket. And I'm like, this is not believable at all uh, uh it would be more believable if they were in the blue o blue oyster bar from 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 police academy because this, this is not i don't buy this no and yeah he's supposed to be this sexy uh vampire and it, it's about as sexy as right said fred in the music video uh i'm sexy uh, uh, you know, do you think I'm sexy or, or whatever? No, I'm too sexy for my shirt. That one got it confused with a bunch of the other, well, uh, uh, sexy songs. Cause there's a ton of them, uh, where guys talk about whether or not people think they're sexy or not. Uh, <laughs> Martin Kemp definitely wasn't, uh, he gave the same energy and vibe that he gave off in the episode blood brothers from, the outer limits from the nineties. And, and that's not the right energy for the vampire. Alyssa Milano for what she was given to work with, I guess is tolerable, but you could tell that she was really uncomfortable with a good amount of the nudity and, and, 
and sex scenes. Like the whole lesbian sequence is really uncomfortable to watch with her and Charlotte Lewis because she's asked to pose nude and try to make it into some sort of sexy lesbian uh, sequence. But you can tell that she just is very uncomfortable with it. And as an audience member, it just makes it rough to watch. And the rest of the cast is much better. I mean, Harrison Pruitt is Chris, just bland, uh, weak, had no chemistry with Charlotte. Well, the character played by Alyssa Milano, like why, why the hell would I or anyone want these two to stay together? They had zero chemistry. I mean, it's not like Alyssa Milano had any chemistry with the vampire, Martin Kemp either, but there's no one that that's like a part of her life other than her friend, Nicole played by Rachel true that you feel like there's any sort of connection with or bond. Uh, yeah. Rachel true. That name you might recognize. She was one of the, the, uh, main uh, members of the cast in the craft. And she's fine here actually. In the little bit that she has when it comes to, uh, the running time, Jordan Ladd plays Eliza, and I think I believe it was yeah it was her big screen debut. She was the daughter of Cheryl Ladd. I think she played a like a I think she played the 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 blonde who was just a preppy bitch, and she did that role pretty well. Charlotte Lewis, you might recognize her. You know she I reckon recognize her the most uh, from her uh, role in The Golden Child, and. It's fun to see her again, but she has a nothing role just as this lesbian photographer who has barely any screen time. And you have Jennifer Tilly who plays Marika, who's also in it for what might as well just be a cameo wearing a leather jacket and smoking a cigarette and just trying to take advantage of Chris in a bar. Uh, Rebecca Ferrati, she's a, um, a model she's in this as a princess and that's really about it that's it for your cast and there's there's no one that delivers a performance that you, that really sinks uh into you uh it doesn't grab you by the throat or the jugular or anything or it's not anything that you want to sink your teeth into again when it comes to watching any of of the people in this cast work the cinematography by Suki Mendevich is, uh, I guess, serviceable for this kind of movie, but nothing really that stupendous or remarkable. Same thing it, uh, occurs or, or uh, applies to uh, the editing by Terry Lynn A. Shropshire. Uh, and the music by Joseph Stanley Williams is just your typical stock, standard, bland dull boring forgettable music for this kind of movie for like an erotic thriller nothing special and yeah it's it films like 92 minutes but it feels like it's longer than that because there's no reason to get invested in the plot who gives a shit whether or not the vampire goes into uh dot 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 permanent sleep or not don't care uh, don't care about uh, um, Charlotte and her awakening or any of that. Uh, don't care about Chris. Uh, so there's really nothing to this film other than boobs. That's it. A little bit of TNA and, and a little bit of titties. And that's all. That's it. That's all, folks. And if you want that, just go watch a porn. Definitely a lot shorter, and uh, it's not as much of a waste of your time. I would say, unless you're a diehard Alyssa Milano fan and you have to see everything that she's ever starred in, I would definitely avoid this movie. But anyway, thank you for watching uh, my uh, review of Embrace of the Vampire. And until next time, I'll see you later. See ya.